Hello, welcome to everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you in this um, excellent uh, session of TCT Asia Pacific, dedicated to um, intracoronary imaging and physiology. I have the pleasure to have with me uh, Dr. Gary Mintz as a uh, co-chairman, and he's going to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Javier. So we have three talks regarding imaging. The first by Jonathan Leipzig is entitled Future of Coronary CT, One-Stop Service of Anatomy and Physiology. Jonathan. Thank you very much for the opportunity and the privilege to uh, share some of my thoughts. Uh, I wish uh, we could be meeting in person in Korea, uh, but hopefully next year. Jonathan Leipzig from Vancouver. I'm gonna share over the next 12 minutes why I think CTA really is a one-stop shop for anatomy and physiology. I do have salient disclosures, most relate to the core lab work that I do to support many structural heart disease trials. I take no compensation for that work, but I have received a grant from GE Healthcare, and I do give advice to heart folk. So what we saw about three months ago was that the ACC and AHA elevated CT to really class one uh, level of evidence A designation uh, for patients with suspected but not yet confirmed coronary disease, both in the stable and acute setting. And they did so, I think, because CT has really answered all of the important questions that we're confronted with when we identify a patient with such symptoms. It's anatomically very accurate. It is highly prognostic and it guides treatment decision making, particularly when augmented with non-invasive physiology following the identification of an anatomical stenosis. This led to, as mentioned, CT being uh, elevated to class one level of evidence A, the only test to be provided such a designation by the ACCHA. So again, why, why this elevation of CTA? I think it starts with the anatomical accuracy. We've known this for a long time, but I thought I would share with you more recent data published as a sub-study of the ischemia trial led by John Mancini. Uh, I participated in this work with others, including Dr. Min, who uh, led the cardiac CT initiative, and he's on the panel, I know. Uh, but what we did was we, we looked at CTs for the purposes of the exclusion of left main disease and diagnosing anatomical disease. And what we found was that CT agreed with invasive angiography 97% of the time. So not perfect agreement. CT doesn't have the temporal resolution of cath with the spatial resolution of cath, but far and away, there's no tool that can remotely non-invasively come close to that degree of agreement with uh, quantitative catheter and geography. In addition, we've seen recent data building on the many, many uh, publications in the last 15 years that have highlighted that not only is CT prognostically powerful, but the prognostic utility of CT extends well beyond that of traditional stress testing. These are data from the ischemia trial published by Harmony Reynolds, highlighting that the extent and severity of anatomical disease by, uh, by CT exhibited a close dose response relationship with mortality. On the other hand, the extent and severity of the stress testing abnormality exhibited no relationship uh, with incident mortality. So the warranty of a negative CT is much longer. The negative likelihood of having an event in the setting of a truly normal CT is much more powerful than a normal spec. And finally, we know that the severity of the disease exhibits a very close relationship with incident risk, not only major adverse cardiovascular events, but even mortality. Now, CT provides us uh, much more than just simply uh, being able to identify uh, the presence of stenosis, but rather provides us an understanding of the extent and severity of atherosclerosis. We've seen from the SCCT guidance that even in clinical practice without um, more uh, elaborate tools, we can provide a measure of atherosclerotic burden by way of the number of segments of stenosis the morphology of the plaque, the presence or absence of positive remodeling and spotty calcium and so on. These tools have allowed us to inform clinical decision-making in a rich way through visual interpretation. And uh, this visual interpretation will be also integrated uh, more, more routinely in uh, the interpretation of coronary CT with the adoption and, and the iteration of the CADRATS document. Now, the focus on atherosclerosis and atherosclerosis characterization is a really important one, but it is also important to reflect that the current evidence would suggest even crude measures from CT, such as the calcium score, are powerful, is a powerful prognosticator uh, as it relates to uh, downstream risk. That the calcium score here in the West Danish Heart Registry, uh, available even from a non-contrast CT, provides a reasonable assessment to the totality of plaque. 
um, and allows you to really understand patient-specific risk. Now, for over a decade, we've seen a lot of interest in the ability to characterize plaque beyond uh, just the presence or absence or the number of segments. These are data from Sadako Motoyama and Jagan Arula published now 13 years ago, highlighting that positive remodeling and low density plaque may in fact be predictive over and above the total plaque burden uh, or over and above stenosis as it relates to risk. Unfortunately, while these, this is certainly of interest and in, in the field continues to explore the opportunities to identify at-risk plaque, what we've seen fairly consistently from the iconic registry um, uh, led uh, in Korea by Hyukje Chang, and then additional work uh, over the years, that the totality of plaque is probably the more powerful predictor or the most powerful predictor of incident events. We saw that recently presented by Harmony Reynolds at the American Heart Association, the total, um, total calcified plaque volume was really the only predictor of events. And in fact, that probably explains why the calcium score is a powerful predictor from the West Danish Heart Registry. So while there's a great deal of interest and excitement um, about plaque characterization, I think one of the real opportunities of CT is to simply uh, visually identify the extent and severity and quantify plaque based on the number of segments uh, of involvement or the calcium score, which provides incremental risk prediction beyond stenosis alone. Now, there are other things that can be looked at. These are also from the iconic registry. This is from Dong Yi Han and uh, Dan Berman, highlighting that some mechanical properties or, or geometric lesion characteristics may help discriminate risk beyond plaque morphology, uh, highlighting that the presence of a lesion uh, based on the distance from the osteum, the presence at a bifurcation and tortuosity provided incremental insight into the risk of a lesion becoming a culprit downstream very uh, basic and uh, anatomical measures, but important insight into the interplay between um, uh, plaque morphology, but also mechanical properties that may be driving risk. Similarly, we saw elegant work, uh, work from Professor Ku now a couple of years ago from the Emerald 1 study, which is being uh, iterated with Emerald 2, highlighting that beyond these geometric lesion characteristics, uh, using computational fluid dynamics, one can help identify uh, measures such as translesional pressure loss and so-called delta FFR that may provide incremental value in discriminating lesions that may become culprits, uh, culprit lesions uh, downstream and patients at risk of myocardial infarction. In this study, uh, uh, Professor Ku highlighted that a delta FFR of 0.12 uh, was a strong predictor of uh, incident myocardial infarction. So much to be done, uh, much uh, as it relates to opportunity, as it relates to not only the identification of plaque, but also the characterization and quantification of plaque, as well as the integration of uh, novel measures such as geometric lesion characteristics and pressure measurements. Now, in closing, I wanted to share where I really think uh, the guidelines committee uh, took hold of the data, and that is because of the integration, not only of rich anatomical information, accuracy, prognosis, and also um, uh, understanding of atherosclerosis, but the opportunity to answer the final question of whether or not a patient should be sent to the cath lab, which is, of course, informed very much by physiology. About 12 years ago, we know that this tool became clinically available or first introduced and was being validated with the accuracy studies, again, very much led uh, in, in Korea at the time by uh, Professor Ku with the Discover Flow study. But over the last 10, 12 years, we've seen real maturation of the technology where it's now highly robust and being used, used routinely in clinical practice without the administration of adenosine and without a change in protocol. It is importantly, not only in stable pain that, that CT is recommended as a class 1A indication, but also acute pain, and very much uh, highlighted in the, by the guidelines committee that the CTA integration is very much supported by the role of uh, non-invasive physiology from FFRCT with class 2A indication for both stable and acute chest pain. They provided that support, I think, for a number of reasons. First and foremost, because FFRCT has been shown to be the most accurate tool for the non-invasive discrimination of physiology, not only in a binary sense. I mean, we've seen a number of analyses looking at PAD or even other CT measures which provide models uh, predictive of the possibility of abnormal pressure somewhere in the coronary tree or somewhere in a vessel. But the opportunity of a combined CT-FFRCT pathway is to really 
evaluate anatomy and interrogate that specific lesion as to whether or not that lesion is causing significantly abnormal pressure loss and whether and what is the morphology of the pref, pressure loss and the phenotype and, and helping refine the understanding whether or not the patient should or should not be referred for invasive angiography and PCI. The other reasons that the uh, guidelines committee have uh, uh, really leaned in and, and, and proposed a CTF, a FARCT pathway, is because it impacted clinical decision making. We've seen this in a number of studies, as well as in the large uh, registry, uh, the advanced registry, highlighting that a CT, FFRCT supported uh, uh, strategy enriches cath lab referral and leads to a higher uh, ca uh, efficiency in the cath lab with a higher PCI to IC ratio than CT alone and then a direct cath or stress testing approach. In addition, FFRCT is also helpful in identifying patients who, in fact, can be safely treated medically and don't need to be referred to the cath lab. These are data from Manesh Patel, the one-year outcome data of, uh, of advance, highlighting that even in the setting of an anatomical stenosis, stenosis if the FFRCT is negative, the patients, in fact, do not need to be uh, catheterized, that they can be treated medically with an incredibly low uh, late revasc rate, as well as a very low uh, spontaneous uh, MI rate. This holds true not only in advance, but more recently in a meta-analysis published by Bjarne Norgard, uh, highlighting from a number of centers that not only is FFRCT a, a discriminatory of risk based on a binary cut point, but that the lower the FFRCT, the higher the risk, the greater the benefit of revascularization. Uh, further clinical utility data highlighting the opportunities of integrating non-invasive uh, uh, physiology in clinical practice. And finally, I think where it's most exciting for interventionalists is that we can actually use these tools, not just to inform decisions about whether or not to send the patient to the cath lab, as in this case, in a setting of a severe left main lesion, but also to enrich cath lab referral to help plan coronary intervention, using uh, data from non-invasive CT, as well as physiology to provide a functional syntax score that, will, that correlates well with the invasive gold standard. But of course, by providing this non-invasively, it allows the interventionalist to help uh, plan her intervention uh, as well as understand uh, how, how to approach uh, complex coronary disease in a fashion that uh, has been shown to um, uh, improve uh, patient selection and uh, further optimize uh, revascularization decision making. Here's such an example, a critical LAD lesion, severely abnormal, and no need even for physiology. It's greater than a 90% stenosis. But in this case, there was a moderate to severe right lesion, which was negative physiologically, highlighting the uh, importance of going to the cath lab with a plan, the intention of revascularizing the LAD and deferring the right coronary. And here's the corresponding uh, invasive FFR. And finally, I think as we continue to, to uh, explore the use of this tool, uh, we'll have a better understanding and a refine, refinement of uh, uh, phenotypes of physiology in advance of the cath lab. Instead of going to the cath lab and having to do uh, mechanized pullbacks to refine our understanding of the phenotypes of physiology, whether it's a focal phenotype as we see here, or a diffuse phenotype, all three of these vessels have abnormal physiology, but the pattern in which they become abnormal is quite different. And therefore the feasibility or the opportunities for focal mechanical intervention by PCI are quite different as well. Well, we can explore this non-invasively and using CT and non-invasive physiology um, provide an understanding of not only the presence or absence of abnormal physiology in an LAD territory, but really what the interventionalist needs to know is where is the physiology abnormal, what is the translational pressure loss, and therefore what is the phenotype of the physiology as he or she plans the, uh, the need for revascularization and the likelihood of uh, success of uh, PCI uh, to resolve abnormal physiology based on the phenotype of uh, the uh, hemodynamic effect of anatomical stenosis. So I'll close there. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity. There are many outstanding questions, but I think the future of cardiac CT is bright. I just highlighted some of them. Obviously there's further opportunities as it relates to atherosclerosis and other measures such as coronary volume to mass, perivascular fat inflammation, and even an opportunity to use an interactive planner to help plan coronary intervention further. But I'll close there and uh, thank you again to the organizers for this invitation. Our second presenter is I.K. Jang from Massachusetts
General Hospital in the US. And IK is going to talk about pericoronary inflammation, how and what. IK? A little more specific uh, project. So I slightly uh, changed the title and vascular inflammation in plaque rupture versus plaque erosion measured by PCAT, uh, pericoronary adipose tissue attenuation. I'll give you a little bit of background. So this is my disclosure. So vascular inflammation is a critical factor, not only in atherogenesis, but, but also in triggering acute coronary syndromes. Uh, this has been a theme of our, my lab for the past 20 years at least. And systemic inflammation markers such as HSCRP, IL-6, and others lack specificity for coronary vascular inflammation. And recently, a novel non-invasive marker of vascular inflammation measured by PCAT attenuation using coronary CTA has been developed. That was in collaboration with um, Daimini Day at Cedar Sinai and Stefan Achenbach uh, in Erlangen, Germany. And most of you may not know, but Stefan was a, a fellow here at MGH a number of years ago. Uh, we have maintained good uh, friendship and this is the project that we did together. A previous study reported that high PCAT attenuation means high vascular inflammation is associated with increased mortality. So very, very strong data. So this is a, a brief um, sort of background how PCAT uh, really works. So pericoronary adipose tissue secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines and other bioactive mediators, which diffuse from the perivascular area do you see my arrow, right? Yes, into the vessel wall. So this is a vessel wall developing atherosclerosis and fibrous cap ruptures and thrombosis. As you see here is the size of adipocyte, initially bigger and it gets smaller and the density drops. So creating gradient. So initially, it is uh, from the uh, perivascular adipocyte into the vessel wall. However, reverse signaling from the vessel wall to the surrounding fat tissue also takes place at the later stage. So as you see here, the pink arrow in the early stage of atherosclerosis from perivascular adipocytes into the vessel wall as, at, oh, sorry. As atherosclerosis progresses, the reverse direction, reverse signaling from the vessel wall to the adipocytes. So inflammatory molecules such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, released from the inflamed vessel wall, diffuse into the perivascular space, inducing lipolysis, as you see here in the right side, and suppressing adipogenesis. So not enough adipocytes are generated. This response induces adipocyte size, reduction, and create gradient of lipophilic phase, resulting in perivascular adipose tissue attenuation. So as I mentioned earlier, the hypothesis of this project was that the level of vascular inflammation is higher in plaque rupture than in plaque erosion. We tried to prove this, not only just OCT, but also more biologic marker, PCAT. So we had previously reported that the plaque vulnerability measured by OCT in plaque rupture in red bar compared to plaque erosion blue bar Vulnerability is higher at culprit lesion, but also at non-culprit lesion. Right, these are typical OCT features of plaque vulnerability. However, that study that we published in JAMA Cardiology was phenotyping of coronary plaques 
and lacks biological information. You know, when you see macrophage, you know there, there are macrophages, but whether they are biologically active or which specific type of macrophage, we do not know. So we need more biologic information, which we try to obtain from PCAD. And therefore, the aim of the current study was to compare the level of vascular inflammation measured by PCAD attenuation between patients with plaque rupture versus plaque erosion. So 198 patients with non-S elevation ACS who underwent both pre-intervention coronary CTA and OCT was selected for this project. And PK attenuation, as I mentioned, was measured by semi-automatic automated software uh, called Autoplac, uh, developed by uh, Damini Day at Cedar Sinai. And culprit lesion pathology was identified by OCT. We had 107 plaque rupture, 91 plaque erosion. So we measured the level of inflammation at three different levels culprit plaque level, culprit vessel level. And culprit vessel, you measure proximal 40 millimeters of LAD CERC, RCA, because of proximal fat, you measure from 10 to 50. So each vessel has 40 millimeter. And then we uh, measured level of inflammation, all three coronary arteries combined, the so pan vascular inflammation level. So this is the key result. PK attenuation, the level of inflammation was higher in plaque rupture than in plaque erosion at culprit plaque level, at the culprit vessel level, and mean combined three coronary arteries. So local inflammation, more diffuse inflammation, and panvascular inflammation. So as I said in the very beginning, this is a panvascular process. And we divided the group into four, depending on uh, PCAD attenuation. So lowest quartile had the probability of plaque rupture, 42.9%, which went up to 50, 52. The highest quartile, 71%. So it's a beautiful gradient. So other features of vulnerability, such as lipid-rich plaque, a macrophage, again, was uh, higher in plaque rupture compared to plaque erosion. Other features such as TIFA, microvessels, cholesterol crystal, there was clear trend, it just didn't reach the significant level. Uni multivariable analysis all showed plaque rupture was significantly associated with higher PK attenuation, means higher level of vascular inflammation at all three levels, plaque, culprit plaque, culprit vessel, and all three coronary arteries combined. So the conclusion of this project was peak head attenuation, the vascular inflammation was higher in plaque rupture than in plaque erosion at all three different levels. The results indicate pan coronary inflammation plays a major role, more important role in plaque rupture than in plaque erosion. Thank you very much. This is MGH 1811 and we are gonna have heart center. We have two twin towers and one will be uh, used exclusively for uh, cardiology, cardiovascular surgery. Anybody with any questions, uh, want to know more about either PCAT or laboratory, please feel free to reach out to me. This is my email. Thank you. Thank you, IK. Let's go on to our third presentation before we get to the discussion. Our third presenter is SJ Park from Asan Medical Center who is the chairman of TCTAP, and he will talk about intracoronary imaging to detect and treat vulnerable plaque. Can we prevent the future event? SJ? Lectures, intracoronary imaging to detect and treat a vulnerable plaque. Can it prevent a future event? Main issue is functionally insignificant negative FFR and vulnerable plaque actually do we have to treat uh, or not to treat, not treat. Background is, if you look at the negative FFR, uh, point 
Uh, modem point eight is very safe. This is our <clears throat> IDIS FFR large registry data. Uh, negative FFR actually cardiac death and MI per year point to one point twenty one percent. It's very low rate. Uh, if you look at the, some, you know, disease subset or uh, <clears throat> clinical subset, uh, ulcerative disease, almost containing these and chronic renal failure, acute chronic syndrome, it will be higher frequency of cardiac death and MI. So, however, still very low, you know, rate of uh, death and MI. Overall, large meta analysis is clearly demonstrate. The active FFR test and MI per year is less than 1%. However, stented segment to 3%. Untreated positive FFR is 5 to 10%, uh, relatively very high test and MI. And so, the active FFR is usually unsafe. That is the rule. Uh, however, what about the defined? Imaging defined bulletable plaque is really safe. And so, uh, prospect uh, studies include the 700 acute syndrome clearly demonstrate uh, uh, using the three person imaging study. Non culprit reason has is quite, you know, similar base rate with the, even the culprit. Uh, lesion subset, we will get a non culprit lesion related treatment. Some, you know, uh, practice a uh, presence of SYNC fiber acetoma. SYNC minimal lumen area less than four millimeters here. It's large plaque burden. So, those factors increase the base weight. If we combine the three factors, large plaque burden, small or minimal lumen area, presence of a SYNC at uh, the uh, base rates almost, uh, you know, 17% very high. So, independent predator uh, defined by palatable, uh, PHR is palatable plaque, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, highest hazard ratio is plaque burden, so more than 70% presence of sink cap and smaller minimal lumen area, less than four millimeters squared. So repeat the core burden is another, you know, predators uh, of uh, palatable plaque, unstable, uh, acute syndrome is higher, uh, lift core burden index, LCBI, uh, separate with a 200, uh, current value of 227, is clearly higher base rate in case of a higher uh, LCBI. So, we define imaging definition of brutal plaque is for predators, plaque burdens, more than 70% and presence of a sink cap as small minimal lumen area, less than four millimeter scale, uh, repeated each plaque on years. <clears throat> a study is more than 315. So uh, imaging defined brutal plaque has a little bit higher rate of maize follow. This is typical cases, negative FFR, <laughs> Relatively, you know, more than 80, 85% stenosis. However, uh, there are some plaque ruptures here, as uh, small or so minimal lumen area. It's a large plaque, but it's more than 70%. Uh, you know, another tip, uh, another uh, imaging by uh, OCT VHRs, the air scan is higher, LCBI, decorative core is 25%, uh, rupture. So we can clearly see that. Another case is negative FFR. Presence of a sink cap, lobster thrombus, as you know, uh, the spectroscopes, maximum HBI is on, on more than 500, very, you know, uh, large repeat containing lesions, a smaller MRAs, large preferred in here. So, optimal medical treatments really uh, can uh, stabilize the plaque uh, vulnerability concerns. So we have uh, uh, some randomized study, stable study, uh, randomized with a high dose uh, losubastatin and low dose 10 millimeter losubastatin. And we measured uh, as a primary endpoint percent necrotic core volume change at one year. So clearly, you know, percent necrotic volume is decreased. However, we didn't find any difference between the high dose <coughs> loss by starting low dose. So anyway, medical treatment with the loss by starting can make a plaque regression and stabilization, stabilization at one year. And question three, a really PCI uh, using the PBS water reading stand stabilize the plaque vulnerability concerns. Yeah, but all 
induced a less than wing chemo hyperplasia in case of sinking fibro isomers compared with the other you know, metallic polymer strut, abrolimus uh, is just re- relatively less in the chemo hyperplasia. PBS associates the plex stabilization and the lumen enlargement. If you look at um, compared with the optimal medical treatment, that PBS stabilized plaque, decreased plaque. The uh, only difference is a decreased lumen. However, in case of a, a PBS, actually increases lumen. That was a background the study. So <clears throat> recently uh, published uh, prospect uh, observed randomized studies. They include uh, the, uh, more than 65% plaque burdens, more than one uh, non-flow emitting and complete regions. Uh, randomized with uh, observed PCI and <clears throat> medical treatment alone, and two years of follow up, so almost 99.5%. If you look at the baseline code of imaging concern, look at this. This is uh, <clears throat> individual practice for vulnerability, track by the moon to 70%, and LCBI index. And uh, out of them, is more than 72%, 77% is more than two or three high risk black characteristics events. Clearly, obviously, I'm ready, uh, two years follow up data, <clears throat> original lesion site, minimal lumen aid is clearly larger in you know, a group with the BBS, and across the entire region subset is statistically significantly larger in BBS group. And clinical <clears throat> top, you know, endpoint target lesion failure at two years actually no difference at all. And it's a little bit different in terms of target PSRMI, it will be higher, PBS, and critical delivery TRL, no difference at all. Reason related maze rate, uh, absolutely, so, you know, <clears throat> higher uh, rate uh, on base in case of a uh, medical treatment alone, not statistical significant number, is small. However, we can clearly see that uh, PCI group has a little bit lower some base rate here. So in detail, uh, BBS versus, you know, <clears throat> medical treatment group, not statistical difference. However, you know, going to be the uh, medical treatment, it will be a higher frequency of progress angina uh, requiring revascularization. And not statistical difference. However, there are some trends in clinical delivery bus and it will be higher, you know, with the medical treatment concern. And the final ultimate question is, uh, which one would be better? So PCI versus optimal medical treatment for vulnerable plaque treatment and so preventive study. Actually, preventive implantation of a PBS or treatment stand compared to the optimal medical treatment on stenosis with a functionally insignificant vulnerable plaque. And so uh, the objective is to determine whether uh, PCI uh, with a PBS or drug-reducing enzymes, implantation of the functionally incident palatable plaque reduced the incidence of a composite base compared to the optimal medical uh, treatment alone. So randomized, multi-center clinical studies, all coma base, approximately 1,600 patients will be enrolled from the international health centers. Inclusion criteria, more than in age 18 years or older, symptomatic, asymptomatic, eligible for PCI, negative FFR, and but the two of the following, the presence of CINCAP, IVCMRA less than four millimeter scares, so plaque burdens more than 70, uh, you know, LCBI actually more than 315, exclusion criteria, Contraindication to dual interpret to rack in less than two years, they are still living in MI, so women who are uh, breastfeeding, et cetera. So, prevent study, any epicardial coronary stenosis with a negative FFR and with the two of the following the presence of CINCAP, and I was never less than four, <coughs> I was plaque with more than 70%, lipid rich plaque on the years, the LCB index more than 315. And, you know, randomized PBS or the routine stand and optimal medical treatment. Primary endpoint as a target basal failure at two years, a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, uh, target basal liver radiation or unplanned uh, hospitalization for angina educated to target basal. So, secondary endpoint include overall maze, non urgent 
revascularization and the rate of uh, cerebrovascular even. A typical example, PBS arms, uh, diameter stenosis 80%, high degree of stenosis, negative FFR, small OMRA to 2.0 millimeter scale to put upon 77. We deployed uh, observed VBS, uh, very old cases, uh, 3.5, 18 millimeter high pressure inflation. Post PCI is quite, you know, well uh, opposed to VBS for the proximal part. So actually, uh, for the discipline trials, eight countries started, eight and pairs, uh, you know, uh, joined together. Uh, we finished the patient in the month last year, so to 17 and October. And we want to wait the result. PCI for political plaque has really, you know, a uh, new paradigm. So we will have an answer in 2024. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, SJ. Um, we now have 12 minutes for discussion. Uh, before I turn it over to the panel, I just want to make one little clarification about Prospect Absorb. It looked like the BVS treated patients had better um, primary endpoint because the primary endpoint was defined as the MLA at two years. But if you look at individual patient data, comparing guideline-directed medical therapy and BVS-treated patients, no patient had lumen loss. So the benefit of BVS at follow-up was entirely the result of lumen gain at the time of the PCI. And so the endpoint is a little bit fishy, um, but the CFD curves show no lumen loss even in the uh, guideline directed medical therapy group. Um, it was just something that gets lost in translation. IK, um, these were patients who presented with ACS, correct? Yes. So we don't really have any information about um, the prognostic value of PCAT um, in high risk patients. Exactly. Okay. It's 189 patients. Right. It's more mechanistic than outcome. But but it um, it certainly supports. Yeah, we, so go ahead. Yeah, no, we do have one year follow up data, which didn't show any significant difference, but we did not expect any significant difference with this number. But it certainly supports years and years of intravascular imaging data suggesting that plaque rupture is a pan coronary process of some kind. Mm -hmm. But all the imaging, as I said, was a phenotyping, lacking right. biologic information. That's what we try to demonstrate. I'm not familiar with the software that was used for mm. um, the CT. Could you just give us a little bit of insights? I don't know the details. You know, <laughs> the first paper uh, was in Lancet by Oxford Group. Uh, and then second uh, group is a Damini Day. Uh, from Cedars. So uh, I asked Stefan Arkenbach, and I don't know too much about CT, and said, which group should I uh, work with? And Stefan had already started collaboration with both groups and said, you know, since we are in the US, why don't you uh, contact her? I, I will give her a call. So that's how I started. It's a three dimensional vascular inflammation information. Obviously, the algorithm is is patented. She's not willing to disclose all the details and I don't have enough knowledge to understand. But we have another project, similar theme, vascular inflammation level, it fits perfect to our, our hypothesis. So I, I think it really does work. Um, Yoshi, you were involved in most of the BVS imaging work. And I've always been intrigued by some slides from Patrick, as well as one that SJ showed, suggesting that BVS was associated with plaque regression at follow-up. But I've never seen that data actually published. And I reviewed a manuscript recently, five-year follow-up after BVS, where there was no return to a normal physiology of the BVS-treated segment. So is that data really correct? 
or are those just individual cases? So I think the, the majority of the positive data of the absorb was uh, made in the first three month trials, like a cohort A study, 30 patients, and cohort B studies, 101 patients. And in those patients, uh, I must say that it is a simple uh, lesion. And uh, probably uh, the implantation was quite uh, well done in terms of the, um, the they do the uh, OCT or the IVAS uh, um, at follow up. And uh, in, in those selected population, we see that really the uh, uh, late room enlargement, especially in the cohort, I think uh, everything was also the part of this uh, first uh, observation. And also for the cohort B in uh, some of the patient, uh, we see the real uh, lumen enlargement. But the, unfortunately, the, uh, the following subsequent data did not confirm the uh, initial findings. In terms of, uh, you know, after the BBS, the lumen enlargement, which I, uh, uh, you know, uh, personally I would eat that one. So, however, in terms of a functional concept, even, you know, after the any, regenerate endotheliums uh, even after the BBS or the other, you know, other uh, things then. Uh, I think it's uh, in the basic research concern, uh, uh, you know, very old data, so however, clearly could not demonstrate a normalized, you know, uh, endothelial function. So I just expect the, you know, uh, bigger lumen after the BBS, however, functionally, you know, recovery to the normal, you know, endothelial functions, I don't believe too much. What about the normal about that? Yes, uh, and um, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and in the preclinical studies, what we have seen is the uh, initially the, the polymer is covered by some neointimal tissue. And after the three years, it's getting uh, replaced by the proteoglycan and uh, the space occupied by the polymer is really gradually assimilated with the uh, fibrous tissue. And at that moment, there was some kind of the uh, reduction of the uh, strut part. So that could be also the uh, reason for the, some, in some cases we see the late room enlargement. But also uh, uh, other um, uh, evidence is from the era of the balloon angioplasty. And also I want to discuss maybe ask uh, some of the colleagues from the Asia that's the, uh, now the drug coated baron is also very popular in Asian country. And some of the uh, OCT findings show that there is also a late lumen enlargement after the drug coated baron. So it might be some kind of a, a reaction to the, to the initial uh, vessel damage and also the uh, freeing from the cages and the vessel nature or the, uh, healing process really taking care of the of the endowment. but um... yeah if I can just jump in if, if we go way way back to the 1990s we did a study called the sure study in Kokori Japan and we did IVIS pre-intervention post-intervention one day one month and six months and after either DCA or balloon angioplasty roughly 50 50 the vessel grows in the first month and the lumen enlarges in the first month in non-stented lesions. It's almost a universal finding. And then it shrinks later on. So what seems to be happening with the drug coated balloon is it's maintaining that early lumen enlargement and it pervades the late negative remodeling. You know, I'm always curious about these studies we did 30 years ago and how they sometimes um, can be resurrected to explain some of the findings. Um, but SJ, the paper that I reviewed after BVS showed no return to normal endothelial function five mm -hmm. years later. Um, that was, it's an, it was a observational study in uh, one of the European countries. So you, you published with uh, Takashi Kubo a uh, number of years ago in JAG. This atherosclerosis is a dynamic process. And in your study, 75% of TICFA stabilized after one year using VH IVUS. So what's your thought on preemptive treatment of so-called vulnerable plaque? 
Yeah, um, I'm still skeptical. I mean, clearly there are patients who develop a vulnerable plaque. The vulnerable plaque ruptures, thrombosis, and they have a bad event. There's no question about that. The question is, what percentage of patients fall into that category and whether we can identify that particular subgroup? If you look at all of atherosclerosis and both in, on a patient basis, on a lesion basis, most of them don't have an acute MI, even though they develop tikvas and the tikvas go away, or they rupture silently and they heal and they just contribute to disease progression. So if we're going to preemptively treat every tikva, we're talking about, you know, an unbelievable effort. And you'll be taking patients to the cath lab who will never have an event and subjecting them to invasive imaging to identify these tikvas. Um, and if you look at the numbers, the numbers make it really hard to justify unless we can identify that particular patient in whom tikva rupture will lead to an acute event. And we haven't done that yet. You know, that's 0 0.4, 0 0.6%. I know the numbers don't make any sense. I mean, yeah. we don't we, we don't know exactly that number, but we can sort of figure it out. And whether it's zero point four to zero point six, or you know zero point one, or you know something very similar, the numbers just don't make sense. Totally um, agree. Actually, I'm going to give another talk on vulnerable plaque research. Very provocative, but I'm on the same page. Gentlemen, we should not forget uh, that we are looking at different populations. The patients I'm worried most are the young patients at the age of 50 with no coronary symptoms whatsoever who drop dead in the streets. And I think we should also be careful to mix these different populations, patients presenting with unstable angina to a cath lab versus these patients who suffer acute cardiac death due to MI. There might be also a difference there. Okay, thank you very much. So I am now going to turn it over to my co-chair who will um, introduce the physiology section. Javier? Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Well, I mean, this has been a fantastic uh, review and update on how biology is uh, really it appearing now in our panorama, in our way of um, investigating coronary artery disease. And we, knew, we now move to a physiology techniques also from very contemporary topics that will be addressed in the next uh, three sessions. And the first speaker is uh, Carlos Colette, who is going to speak about a very contemporary uh, topic of interest, which is uh, post-PCI FFR. Uh, Carlos. Well, thank you very much for this kind of invitation. And I really like the title because it, uh, it left it open for me to actually go into post-PCI FFR in general and discuss a little bit where we are concerning this particular uh, physiologic metric. Uh, my name is Carlos Colette. I'm an interventional cardiologist and I work in the cardiovascular center in ALS in Belgium. These are my disclosures. And post-PCI physiology is uh, nothing new. If we go back 40 years and look at the first paper of Andreas Grunsik showing the first series of, of PCI, we see that one of the figures is actually one uh, uh, intracoronary pullback of pressure showing very nicely a focal disease in this proximal, this was an LAD. But if you go down that same paper and you keep scrolling through the figures, you see that he also used intracoronary pressure measurements to understand the results of PCI. In other words, some sort of post-PCI uh, FFR in that uh, time pressure gradients. And he nicely correlate the reduction in the pressure gradients with the reduction in percent diameter stenosis. We're in 2022, and we feel that we're going back to the future in the sense that we have understood how to use FFR as one metric to assess lesion significance, but now we're trying to take uh, the most information we can from these physiologic measurements. And I'm specifically talking about two points, which is the characterization of disease, and we're talking about focal and diffuse coronary artery disease before we implant the stent, and the second uh, important topic 
that we're moving toward, which is PCI optimization based on post-PCI physiology. And if we look at the landscape of post-PCIFR, there are several papers uh, that have associated post-PCIFR with maize and also the change in FFR with improvement in angina. But there are several factors that actually have some sort of causality with post-PCIFR. Uh, there are some uh, clinical characteristics, the, the, the type of PCI, the PCI technique, the use of imaging has been associated with higher post-PCIFR. And of course, the CAD patterns largely determined post-PCIFR. But when we look at the post-PCIFR evidence, and I'm showing you now an individual patient level meta-analysis of more than uh, 2,400 uh, 2, patients, we see that uh, in this graph that the uh, probability of target vessel failure increases with the lower FFR. In other words, by every decrease in 10 FFR units, you increase the risk of target vessel failure by about 40%. If we plot this now into a kaplan meier curve, we see that I'm showing you now uh, the kaplan meier for cardiac death and MI, and we see that patients that achieve higher post-PCFFR have about 30% uh, uh, risk reduction compared to those with low post-PCFFR. So this is what we know. But what is actually the main determinant of post-PCFFR is really post-PCFFR a marker of prognosis, or is just a bystander in the relationship between the CAD pattern and uh, a maze. And we have to understand that we are treating actually sometimes two different types of disease. This is not so easy to assess with angiography, but we know that we have a focal disease, which is actually localized disease and cases of more diffuse disease. The, is, the, differ the difference is that when we do PCI in patients with focal disease, the blood flow is almost completely improved. But when we do PCI in focal disease, there is residual disease at the edge of the stand, residual disease in the vessel, and there is not a significant improvement in blood flow. We have developed a tool that uh, allows us to quantify the disease pattern in focal or diffuse, and we call this the PPG or the pullback pressure gradient. This is a simple metric. It goes from zero, that is diffuse, to one, that is focal. And you see two nice examples on the left of diffuse coronary artery disease, and in the right, two of uh, focal disease. But what is really interesting is to look at the relationship between PPG, you see it now in the x-axis, and the improvement in flow, in this case, in the y-axis with delta FFR. And you see immediately that patients with focal disease have significantly higher improvement in flow or in delta FFR compared to those with diffuse disease. When we look at the statistics, we see that the R-square for this relationship is 51% meaning that almost half of the improvement that we achieve with PCI in terms of flow are determined by the disease that that patient actually has. So if we keep looking into this relationship, we now also have identified that there is a confounding factor of the vessel type in the sense that the LAD appears to behave differently from non-LADs what concerns the predicted capacity of post-PCFFR for maize. I'll show you the data. This is the same meta-analysis. In this case, three more than 3,000 post-PCI FFR measurements. And I want to bring your attention to the panel B, where the FFR that is in red post-PCI is significantly lower than the post-PCI FFR in the CERB or in the right coronary artery. We have quantified this difference. This is a mean difference of post-PCI FFR between LADs and non-LADs. And this is about 0.06 unit less in the LAD compares to non-LADs. There are various, uh, several mechanisms that actually explain this difference. It can go to the, the amount of myocardial mass that is subtended for, by the LAD or by the vessel volume of the LAD. I, I brought this example because for me, this is pretty clarifying in the sense that this is a pullback of an LAD. And you see that this is a motorized FFR pullback curve in yellow. And you see that despite the absence of disease confirmed by OCT, the post-PCFFR is 92. And you see that there is a downslope in the pullback curve. I'm going to show you what happened in the right coronary artery, which is, has less mass, perhaps more vessel volume. And you see here the same example. And it's striking to see that the profile of the curve is completely different to the one in the LED than the RCA, it's more flat pullback profile and have the higher FFR, in this case, 1.0. So the question is, is this really important? 
So we have looked at the predicted capacity, not only of post-PCIFR for target vessel failure, but now stratified by LAD and non-LAD. And this is what I'm showing the right side of the screen. This ROC curve, the blue line correspond to non-LAD, where the best cutoff to predict events appears to be higher than the LAD, which is 80 versus 90. And again, the post-PCI FFR in the non-LADs appears to have a better prognostic ability compared to the one derived from LADs. When we use this differential cutoff, 80 for, non, for LADs and 90 for non-LADs, and we use this value to uh, segregate patients according to the post-PCI FFR results, this is what we found. Again, a confirmation that patients with high post-PCI FFR have better prognosis in terms of target vessel failure, irrespective of the vessel treat. Now, post-PCI FFR is, is an heterogeneous entity. You can have post-PCI FFR that is low because there is an instant focal gradient, a gradient outside the stand, or a diffuse gradient along the vessels. And these three entities have different therapeutic implications. If we think about instant focal gradients, this is most of the, most of the time related to instant uh, uh, under expansion or extend under expansion. And you see these uh, steps in the FFR pullback that are exactly related to the place where the under expansion is. And we know that extended expansion and low MSA is a surrogate for adverse event. The second entity is a difficult one to, uh, to tackle uh, because it relates to the presence of focal gradients outside the stented area. And this relates, of course, to residual focal disease. And what we know so far is that from the uh, theoretical point of view, leaving this stenosis that may have a lot of plaque stress, uh, generating plaque fatigue, may, uh, at the end of the day, when these physical forces exceed the material strength of the plaque, result in plaque rupture. And this goes in line with what we're discussing in the previous session about the preemptive therapy of uh, vulnerable plaques. And the last but not least is a diffuse pattern of disease. We, we have no uh, tool to treat. So these are the patients that should be treated with medical therapy. There are remaining questions in the post-PCI FFR landscape. We don't know if treating the uh, patient after confirming a low post-PCI FFR value, either by implanting another stent or another maneuver, will result in improved clinical outcomes, but this is under investigation. And the link between post-PCI FFR and MACE, and specifically the association between the diffuse or focal residual pressure gradients we don't know exactly how these two actually translate into adverse clinical events. But we can conclude that one, post-PCFFR is largely dependent on the baseline CAD pattern that can be quantified by the PPG. Second, post-PCFFR is an independent predictor of maze, but it has a moderate predicted ability for events with an AUC, as you have seen, of 0.56. Post-PCFFR should be interpreted as a vessel-specific metric. Post-PCFFRs in the LAD are never one and are in mean 0.6 FFR units lower than in non-LADs. The mechanisms that lead to low, low post-PCFFR should be elucidated, and the way to do this is to perform a pullback maneuver after the stent has been implanted. And of course, further investigation is still required to understand if reacting to the post-PCI FFR value translate into better clinical outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. This was a very interesting uh, lecture. Let's move to the next one. It's a lecture by uh, Dr. Niels Johnson, which is entitled uh, Coronary Physiology in Patients with Severe Aortic Stenosis, Decision-Making in Tavern Patients. Niels, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Park and the TCTAP panel for the invitation to speak. Uh, these are my disclosures, nothing exactly relevant to this talk. And I'd like to start off with the guidelines because I think it gives us a good sense of where we are now as well as some of the data that's going to come soon. The European guidelines are actually very focused on anatomy when making revascularization decisions for TAVI patients. You can see that they recommend using percent diameter stenosis and explicitly make the comment that FFR has not been validated in patients with AS, although they highlight that several ongoing randomized trials will be coming soon to give more insight. In contrast, the American guidelines are a little bit more flexible. You can see that they recommend not only percent diameter stenosis, but also allow for both resting and hyperemic physiology, which they say is safe and feasible in patients who have severe AS. Yes. 
you'll notice a commonality to both of them is that they really want to uh, focus on very proximal lesions and that they give the uh, data a class 2A recommendation and a level of evidence C, so fairly modest and something that will be improved in the coming years. And the reason for that is that there are uh, several ongoing randomized trials really looking at every one of the three treatment strategies. Do we just conservatively treat these lesions with medical therapy? Do we use anatomy or do we use physiology? And in the last several months, we've seen the publication of the activation study, which was a trial comparing percent diameter stenosis against conservative treatment for patients who are undergoing TAVI. Now you'll see that the primary endpoint of death and hospitalization was no different after one year. But on the other side, because uh, patients who underwent PCI had higher rates of DAPT use, there was increased risk of bleeding. However, the drawback to the study is that the vast majority, almost 70% of patients had no angina. And so therefore, a little bit of question of uh, were they too asymptomatic to really benefit from PCI? Uh, you can see that in general, these lesions uh, treated were in the LAD and were relatively short segment and high percent diameter stenosis beforehand. The very large, if you will, mega trial that's uh, just starting up now is called Complete TAVR, 4,000 subjects that uh, is going on looking at randomizing patients, interestingly enough, after the TAVI is com finished, uh, comparing medical therapy against routine PCI. But of course, the challenge with this trial is that the exclusion criteria are those patients who've had PCI performed before the TAVI or where it was planned up front to do revascularization afterwards. And this kind of begs the question about timing and perhaps the lower risk patients will be shunted into this kind of protocol afterwards. Uh, the Notion 3 study out of Scandinavia is comparing FFR versus a medical therapy alone in about 450 subjects. It's an ongoing trial. And there's a study out of Italy called uh, FATAVI comparing FFR against a angiographic guided strategy in just over 300 subjects. It's also ongoing. So while we wait for that data, really the best that I have to offer you at the moment is observational studies looking at physiology. This is data from a single center, and it really shows that FFR in aortic stenosis appears to work the same way that it does in patients who don't have aortic stenosis. When you use FFR, of course, you defer more lesions, you implant fewer stents, and it seems to be associated with better outcomes over the next several years, although again, with all the caveats of observational data. So before we talk about physiology in specific uh, for the coronaries, what I want to highlight is the role play with perhaps the most important pathophysiologic consequence of aortic stenosis, and that's left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, as you recall, uh, the Mayo major determinants of myocardial oxygen demand include uh, wall stress, and that wall stress is then something that the heart tries to reduce back to uh, levels uh, that were happening before the aortic stenosis developed by thickening up the wall. And this, and this left ventricular hypertrophy then affects the bed in the following way. When we think about the amount of flow we're able to push down the coronary arteries, that's on the y-axis here, as a function of how much the coronary driving pressure is, we know that during hyperemia that this is a relatively straight line, and that's been known for many decades, even going back to uh, Nico's work in development of FFR. And of course, this line has two important properties. It can change its slope, or it can shift to the left and right and change its offset. Now, what happens with left ventricular hypertrophy is it affects both of those aspects. And this is some great animal work by Dirk Dunker back around the same period that FFR was being developed, where he did supra aortic uh, valve stenosis by introducing bands when the dogs uh, were young. And you can see he introduced gradients of about 20 or 25 millimeters of mercury. And you can see when that happens that the line then rotates clockwise. In other words, it takes the same pressure, but produces left, less flow. And this amount of rotation was really exquisitely related to the degree of left ventricular hypertrophy that had developed. Also, he saw that these curves then shifted to the right with aortic stenosis. In other words, there was a higher coronary back pressure, and this coronary back pressure was really tightly related to the left ventricular filling pressures. So when we think about what this means for the uh, myocardial bed, we can see that perhaps we start off with a red line there for a patient who has severe aortic stenosis. When we relieve the aortic stenosis, uh, we reduce LV filling pressures, and that shifts the curve to the left. And then over time, as the ventricle remodels and left ventricular hypertrophy decreases, then the line rotates upwards, and that is the remodeling that happens over the longer term. 
And as we've seen from the partner data as summarized on this slide, the more left ventricular hypertrophy that regresses, the better the patients do. Uh, this is looking at many of the different partner cohorts, both uh, with transcatheter and surgical aortic valves. And you can see the kind of decrease in left ventricular mass index over the subsequent years. Uh, it eventually drops to something like um, maybe 20 or 25% decrease after three years. And interestingly, this decrease in left ventricular hypertrophy is tightly related then to all-cause death and rehospitalization. So the more you regress your LVH after you remove the aortic stenosis, the better the patients do. All right, well, let's take that knowledge then about left ventricular hypertrophy and its effects on the myocardial bed to then understand why FFR can change before and after transcatheter valve implantation. These are some uh, dramatic examples from the group in Italy looking at uh, FFR in different vessels uh, measured both before and after TAVI. And you can see that uh, in general, the FFR values uh, decrease afterwards compared to before, although you might say, well, they've just picked some very dramatic examples here for the figure. How is this then when it's performed in a more systematic way? And this is probably the largest series that's been published uh, from the center in Italy. You can see over 130 lesions. And on average, the FFR values are more no different before and after transcatheter valve implants. However, as you can see with the colors, there was an interaction depending on how the FFR value was. If the FFR value was high, then it didn't really change very much. Whereas when the FFR value is low, and those are the ones that are highlighted in red, then there seemed to be a decrease. And you can see that there are actually a handful of lesions here, I think many of which were shown in the previous slide, uh, that actually switched over the FFR gray zone from above 0.8 to less than uh, 0.75. And why does this happen? Well, we've been thinking about the bed for a little bit and how left ventricular hypertrophy affects it. And now we need to understand how the coronary stenosis interacts with it. In other words, a coronary valvular coupling. And so this then is the curve that I'd shown previously for the bed in red. But now what we've included is the purple curve for the coronary lesion, which has both a viscous and quadratic parts to it. So where these two curves intersect, that's the FFR value that we measure clinically. Now, because the stenosis doesn't change after we do TAVI, but the myocardial bed does, what happens immediately afterwards probably is a fall in left ventricular filling pressures, as well as some uh, drop in the uh, myocardial resistance, and that shifts the curve as shown. And so perhaps you inch along the uh, stenosis curve and get a slightly lower FFR value. And then if you were to bring the patient back, say six or 12 months later, as left ventricular hypertrophy regresses in the LV remodels, uh, we see the further shifting of the myocardial curve, and therefore it reaches a different FFR on the coronary stenosis curve. This is different than if you have a very mild stenosis. Mild stenoses have a fairly linear relationship between pressure loss and flow. They behave as resistors. And so the FFR value then doesn't really change very much, even despite dramatic remodeling of the left ventricular muscle after TAVI. This is something that I think is broadly supported by the literature. The slide is meant to overwhelm you with the literature. You can see about 400 vessels have been studied where they've measured a large number of hyperemic indexes uh, at baseline and in short and long term after surgical aortic valve therapy, uh, up to six to 15 months. And in general, hyperemia increases after removing severe aortic stenosis. Whereas on the other hand, uh, resting metrics, either resting perfusion or a non-hyperemic pressure ratio seem to stay roughly the same. This notion of how left ventricular remodeling affects coronary physiology is something that's being studied in the ongoing COMIC trial. Uh, this is something that uh, have provided a nice example of. You can see this uh, LED had an FFR of 0.86 before TAVI, uh, and then six months later it had dropped down to 8.2, affected by both the decrease in LV mass from 126 to 107, as well as uh, left ventricular unloading with the LV and diastolic pressures decreasing from 24 to 16 millimeters of mercury. So in summary, we've got a lot of different choices here, and I just wanted to highlight a few things in these last couple of slides, uh, comparing some of the work that's been done in the last year or two, uh, comparing uh, hyperemic to non-hyperemic indexes of coronary physiology. The study on the left-hand side used SPECT as the reference standard and found that FFR had a higher area under the curve compared to non-hyperemic pressure ratios. This is something that's continuing to be studied in a separate trial using uh, PET as the endpoint. And on the right-hand side, a relatively recent study from the CAST FFR trial, uh, looking at FFRCT's ability to predict coronary physiology, but they also recorded non-hyperemic pressure ratios 
And you can really see that all five of them uh, have very similar diagnostic properties when using FFR as the reference standard. So I think any of the non-hyperemic pressure ratios offer similar diagnostic performance. Of course, there's other tools that are out there now, and you'll see a lot of papers in the literature about this, looking at angiographic-based simulations of FFR, either using invasive angiograms or CT angiography. Do these provide any more different or useful information, I think is an ongoing research question. I'd like to conclude by really hoping that I think we need to ask the same questions about PCI in aortic stenosis that we do for patients who don't have aortic stenosis. And the key benefits as shown here really seem to be a reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction as we've seen in the FFR trials and in the ischemia trial, and also an improvement in symptoms as we've seen in the Orbita trial. And unfortunately, a lot of the trials that are ongoing um, don't explicitly look at these metrics. So I think what we'll have to do is to go back and try to tease out these signals from it to understand if coronary physiology operates any differently in the setting of severe aortic stenosis than it does for patients uh, in general where we do select for PCI. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nils, uh, for this uh, uh, outstanding uh, talk about uh, aortic stenosis and coronary physiology. Let's move now to the um, uh, final lecture in this block. Uh, the lecture is by Jungmin An um, from ASA Medical Center. And uh, the topic of the lecture is, sorry about that, uh, is the, the discordance between FFR and IFR. It's a technical pitfall or clinically meaningful. Uh, thank you, uh, Jung. The floor is yours. My topic is discordant between the FFR and IFR. This is my disclosure. Actually, we have many indices, non-invasive functional study and invasive functional study FFR and non hyperion pressure ratios, IFR, resting PDP, and DPR, IFR. Traditionally, as an intervention is to, to treat the coronary stenosis, we try to detect the objective ischemia. How to do the during the stress, stress status, we try to demonstrate the decreased coronary blood flow. So the, what is the, what, uh, by the reduction of myocardial perfusion or the um, contractility abnormality, electrical abnormality, we call it the direct evidence of ischemia. However, in, in my cath lab, we can use this kind of non-invasive functional study. So uh, Nico Pires uh, invented the FFR as a non-invasive functional study in the cath lab. This is your first uh, validate, uh, this is a very, uh, very early validation papers that show that uh, less than 0.75 uh, one, one of three different non-invasive functional studies showed a positive. More importantly, the more than 0.75 positive test is very rare. So the FFR cutoff value 0.75 showed a very high positive predictive value and very high negative predictive value. However, FFR requires hyperemia. Some patient hyperemia is contraindicated this likely and at cost and time and inconvenience. So the 2011, one group, uh, Javier and uh, groups made the uh, IFR concept. What is the concept of IFR? During resting status, uh, they defined the wave-free period. Uh, during the wave-free period, the myocardial resistance is very low. So if we can measure the PDP ratio, it would be very similar to the FFR. So based on the ROC curve analysis, uh, the IFR cutoff value of 0.89 is the best predictive value of, to predict the FFR value of 0.80. So thereafter, the ACC 2017, two random trial published the IFR is not inferior to the FFR to guide the revascularization decision. Define flare and IFR sweet heart trials. So nowadays, FFR and IFR are recommended to assess the hemodynamic relevance of intermediate grade stenosis. Then, are they same or different? Uh, this is our case a 61 year old male with a foot chest pain. We measured F IFR and FFR. IFR is 0.95, but FFR is 0.75. Uh, how many this kind of uh, discordant occurred? Frequency of FFR and IFR discordant is uh, between the 15 to the 20%. One study showed a 13.7% discordant. Uh, 
The other study, 20.6% of discordant. One meta-analysis demonstrates that the IFR accuracy to predict FFR 0.80 is 81%. So roughly, there, are two, uh, there is a 20% discordant rate between the FFR and IFR decision makings. Our data show that the similar findings, FFR and IFR difference is uh, the, uh, about uh, 20%. So what is background or physiologic characteristic of such discordant lesions? Uh, Cooks uh, published the data that uh, IFR, FFR discordant lesion, there is a, a difference regarding the CFR. The FFR positive and IFR negative lesion has a higher CFR value compared with the, uh, compared with the lesion with FFR negative IFR positive lesions. Uh, Korean group uh, showed the similar findings, but uh, no statistical difference, even though the high FFR, low I, uh, high IFR, low FFR group has a uh, high CFR value. So one physiologic characteristic of this current lesion is a difference in the coronary flood, coronary flood result. And what is the, the anatomical characteristic of this cordon to lesion? The, this is the CT data. They evaluated the number of adverse plot characteristics, this cordon to lesion, FFR negative, IFR positive lesions. And they show that the number of APC adverse plot characteristic is very low. However, FFR positive, IFR negative uh, plot APC number is higher. So adverse plot characteristic related more strongly also with FFR than IFR. In addition, the IFR positive and FFR, FFR positive and IFR negative lesion is more frequently associated with the focal disease and FFR negative and IFR positive lesion is more frequently associated with diffusion lesion. So uh, this, uh, this study, this data suggesting that uh, FFR would it be a more reliable index for the coronary intervention? Nathan, what is the clinical characteristic of this cordon to lesion? We published this data. This is not comparison between FFR and IFR. Instead, we, com we compare the FF FFR with the resting PDPA. So this cordon to lesion the determinant is age, gender, diabetes, location of stenosis, left to main or proximal LAD location is just uh, associated with uh, uh, high FFR but low, a uh, high resting PDPA but low FFR. In addition, tight stenosis and complex lesion is also associated with uh, high resting PDPA but low FFR. So some clinical characteristic AG, gender, and some angiography findings, proximal location, and complex tight lesion is associated with the discordant lesion. So what is the outcomes of FFR and IFR discordant lesion? So far, we didn't have enough evidence about the prognosis of discordant lesion. One uh, study showed that they enrolled only 300 patients. Discordant lesion instance is very rare. Anyway, there is no st uh, st prognostic difference between the high FFR, low IFR, and low FFR and high IFR groups. But uh, we have uh, some signal that uh, low FFR discordant to show that higher uh, incidence of uh, cardiac event, but uh, we need more uh, follow-up time. So uh, I, I'd like to show you in the future conference. Then the how to compromise this kind of discordant to many uh, many uh, many physicians suggest that the physiologic consideration, the IFR, FFR equation, but I'd like to suggest you that the anatomical consideration, considering the clinical and anatomical uh, characteristic of this cordant lesion. I like to say that the left main proximal lesion, the FFR zone, and other bifurcation, small, vein, small, small vessel, and this are vessel, I like to call it the IFR zone or non hyperbaric pressure ratio zone. So left to main proximal LAD is more pronounced important. We have to measure, I think, the FFR, particularly the diameter synergies looks tight and looks complex. This is my summary. Discordance between IFR and FFR decision making is about 20%. Discordant lesions have a distinct physiologic and anatomical characteristics. 
in my practice, I measured FFR4 reverse rise decision. Following pressure wire was in, inserted, producing hyperemia is not a practically big deal, and FFR is more sensitive to the anatomical change than IFR. But IFR could be used in daily practice, particularly when hyperemic agents are not available or contraindicated. However, left main or the proximal AD regions, prognostically important regions should be assessed by FFR because of high incidence of IFR negative or positive discordant. However, study for long-term prognosis concerning discordant region with acceptable power is necessary. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Yu Ming. Uh, fantastic, uh, very interesting uh, lecture. Now, so we now move to uh, the, perhaps the most interesting part after having attended these great lectures, which is the debate. And of course, we're looking for your questions. But in the meantime, I would like to ask uh, our panelists for any comments that they may have. Let me just start by Evelyn Rieger. Evelyn, do you have any comments on the, the lectures that you, we just have seen? I think these were fascinating lectures, uh, helping us to better understand what we do in our daily practice in the cath lab. And having said that, I would like, I'm, I'm still puzzled with the presentation of Dr. Colette in this um, post FFR values, especially in the LED. Um, and in my mind, I'm a little bit puzzled um, on why we see, generally speaking, in these um, patient cohorts, a lower FFR in LAD. So my question to Dr. Colette is, um, were these patients that underwent angiographic guided PCI um, or were these imaging guided PCIs? And do you see any potential value of imaging guidance in improving the FFR post? PCI in, in these LED lesions? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the question. Uh, so concerning the population that we have included, this is actually a mix. So there is quite a large population coming from data set uh, from Asia that have quite some intravascular imaging guided PCI and also uh, the FAME data sets are included with the majority of patients treated with angioguided PCI. But the explanation of why the post PCF far in the LED is lower is quite simple. And it relates to the fact that when the patient is lying down on the table, the LED actually goes upwards. And that actually increases the hydrostatic pressure against the sensor of the FFR that is uh, across through the LED. And the second element of the equation is that the aortic pressure is measured via fluid field catheter. And then you have two pressures, one of the days receiving the hydrostatic effect and the other that comes via the fluid field system. And this makes, a, I would say, an, an artifactual measurement error. And this is the reason why the FFR and the LED is lower. Exactly the opposite happens in the right, because the right goes down when the patient is lying down. And this is the reason why it's not abnormal to see FFRs of 1.02, 1.04 in the right coronary artery. Okay, and what does it mean for clinical practice? Should we refrain from treating LED lesions with an FFR of 0.79 or 0.78? That is a great question. And uh, when we look at these data, of course, the first question was, how is the pre-PCI pre data looking? And we look at the data and it appears that the effect of this stenosis is relatively important in the sense that the pre-PCI FFR in this cohort is the same in the three vessels. So we are now confident that this uh, effect that we see is more visible when the epicardial resistance has been removed by the PCI. So no difference in pre-PCI FFR whatsoever, but yes, difference in the post-PCI FFR. Carlos, um, obviously one of the studies that we had last year, the target FFR, they provided one of the first prospective insights on the possibility of performing optimization of PCI based on, on FFR. And I don't know, I would like to hear about your comments about the results. I think that many people felt that they were a bit discouraging in the sense that the um, optimization was uh, perhaps to put it in the best possible way, modest. Can you elaborate about the um, obstacles, the difficulties of performing PCI optimization based on the information that you obtain with longitudinal vessel analysis? 
That's a great question, Javier. And we have looked at the data of target FFR in detail, pullback by pullback. And uh, what I can tell you is that uh, first, the target protocol consisted on a post-PCI FFR pullback after, of course, the procedure has been declared optimal. And this is when actually the randomization starts. And they have performed uh, additional PCIs or post-dilatation based on the presence of residual focal uh, gradients. What I can tell you, Javier, that the whole result of target is driven by the amount of diffuse disease that was included at the beginning. So we have performed what we call the PPG target analysis, and there is a significant interaction between the baseline pattern of disease being focal or diffuse and the randomization arm for the outcome of post-PCI FFR. In other words, the patients with focal disease really got high post-PCI FFR, whereas the, uh, the physiological optimization had almost no effect in patients with diffuse disease. And it's the implication of that is interesting. What it means is that the FFR after PCI is a little bit too late to start worrying about it. In fact, the time to worry about what you're going to end up with is before you start. Uh, and, and patients can't pick whether or not their disease is focal or diffuse. That's, that's just how they show up. And, and so perhaps the lesson is just another reminder, again, Gary was mentioning, like going back 30 years, is that, you know, PCI is really best suited for short focal disease. And it's just another reminder that those are the patients that PCI is best suited for. And so that's what FFR afterwards is another very quantitative um, objective metric. So let me um, ask you, uh, now that no, you mentioned yeah. that... If, it, if okay. I can jump in, Javi, but, okay. but there is data relating the post-PCI FFR in the LAD to the pre-PCI FFR in the LAD. And the lower the pre-PCI FFR in the LAD, the lower the post-PCI FFR, as, as well as lesion length. I mean, that's been around for a long time. So, I mean, while I... I'm intrigued by your hydrostatic um, uh, influence concepts. I think it's more than that. Javier, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's, that's perfect. Thank you very much for jumping in. I think it was very important. I uh, just wanted to highlight that the point that, um, that Neil made probably is very important for the colleagues. We are perhaps moving to, to the point of uh, simulating or predicting what will be the results of PCI. Uh, from baseline interrogation of vessels, and then deciding whether it is worth, per, per, uh, in some cases, performing PCI, and of course, uh, knowing exactly which is the segment that you can you have to treat. And by doing so, as, as Neil was uh, suggesting, probably is the best way to not come, not arriving too late when perhaps you know geometric mismatch has had taken place and you have stented the wrong place or whatever. Niels, perhaps we should uh, move to your uh, presentation on aortic stenosis. Uh, I think it was, as always, very interesting, very nice. Let me ask you a practical question. You highlighted that probably the, the, the benefits of um, revascularization in patients with aortic stenosis, like in patients who have stable coronary artery disease, is the relief of symptoms. And therefore, perhaps there is less um, importance of treating stenosis in patients with aortic stenosis that have no symptoms. Can you comment uh, in how, based on all that you shared with us, all the information that is available, how do you manage in clinical practice before a patient who has aortic stenosis and coronary artery disease? How, how all this has influenced your management of patients? I think that the, the same principles that I had before in a way still apply, and that's that vessels that have very little gradients, high FFRs, I don't, I don't treat them. Uh, I think that uh, patients who have a lot of diffuse disease, again, I, I try to stay away from those ones. And if patients have few or no symptoms of angina, I really want to be careful before jumping in and treating them. And I would say that those guiding principles are ones that I still apply to the patient who has a severe aortic stenosis. And so it's, it's very rare that we'll run into patients who we're considering for TAVI where it's a critical left vein or a critical um, proximal lesion in the LED or something like that. But those, those kind of cases, I must admit, I'm a little bit squeamish about. And so I try to do some kind of revascularization in them beforehand. But the, the vast majority then are patients where you probably think the symptoms are being driven by the valve. 
And it's again, uncommon there to have very large focal gradients in the epicardial coronary arteries. And so I think that uh, my concern for some of those trials that are ongoing like complete is that because they are taking patients after TAVI, probably the patients who have a lot of angina then are not going to go into that pool. So you'll end up with a very uh, less symptomatic population like activation enrolled. And then also at the end of the day afterwards, you'll end up doing PCI and it probably won't provide too much benefit. And so I, I, I wonder if maybe we shouldn't go back to the drawing board a little bit and think about what kind of trials we need rather than uh, the ones that uh, have been started on this one. Let me, let me ask uh, Takashi. I yeah. see that Takashi is with us and uh, to comment on, on, on this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to ask about the very basic uh, concept of FFR. FFR is a, a calculate a basically a PD a minus PV over PA minus PV. But in our daily clinical practice, PV should be a neglectable, right? Because of the small. But uh, in case of AES, as Neil said, uh, the back pressure should be uh, very high. So if we take into account uh, the LVEDP, if we measure uh, FFR myo correctly based on the basic principle, I, I think uh, the, the pre and post uh, FFR measurement might not be so different. Uh, do you have an, any experience uh, of uh, the, the measurement FFR taking into the, the LB EDP news? Yeah, and so what what uh, I think is interesting was the COMIC trial that I mentioned, right? They're going to be measuring LVEDPs uh, before and after TAVI, and then they'll bring patients back. I think it's six months later for another evaluation. And so um, I'm hoping that that will let us put some numbers behind the idea that you brought up. And that's that um, probably early on, immediately after TAVI, a lot of what we see are the changes in LV filling pressures, which you're right, probably... Uh, also reflect reductions in central venous pressures. Uh, but then what certainly does happen over the next six to 12 months is LV remodeling, regression of hypertrophy. And in some cases that can also lead to uh, lower FFR values because you're able to achieve uh, more hyperemia now that the, the ventricle has remodeled. Uh, it's interesting though that in general, these effects, we kind of obsess about them and that kind of thing, but they tend to be fairly modest, right? When you look at the absolute changes here, we're not talking about FFRs going from you know, 0.9 to 0.6, right? Th th these are often kind of five or six point changes, uh, which often don't impact the clinical management because they're either on one side or the other side of the gray zone. Yeah, but Niels, the demand goes way down. So, and, so any FFR change is almost meaningless when you factor in both the reduction in afterload and the reduction in hypertrophy. You know, you know, what's interesting is that there's no change in myocardial uh, resting perfusion before and after valve replacement. And what that suggests is that actually the left ventricular hypertrophy is able to completely compensate and renormalize my myocardial oxygen consumption. Now, if things are different under conditions of stress, but simply under baseline conditions, it's actually beautiful that hypertrophy mm. completely neglates that, yeah. So, but you, still, but you still get rid of afterload. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's why the LVH regresses. Yes. So let me ask just uh, for the final uh, questions. We are running out of time, but uh, I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask uh, Yu Min An about connecting his talk on the hyperemic resting indexes and the guidance of PCI, uh, physiological guidance, in the in the sense that. Uh, Carlos Colet explained. What are your thoughts? Any advantages of using uh, non-hyperemic ratios in for guidance of PCI over FFR, or are the same? Oh, thank you very much. Very, I think very important questions. So, as you mentioned in my slide, uh, the FFR required hyperemia, so the patient uh, com sometimes complained of discomfort, and then so the. Uh, so uh, and then uh, at the cost. Uh, so in this regard, uh, the non-hyperemic pressure ratio IFR would be very uh, patient comfort comfortable. So the in addition, the rend two randomized trial demonstration that IFR is non inferior to the FFR regarding the devastation decision making. So the in practical meaning in in, in day, uh, daily practices, the IFR uh, we can use the IFR. 
Hi, uh, in addition, the which one would be better is not a good discussion. But uh, if the one physician is familiar with the one index, then the uh, uh, so then the uh, uh, it would be the good way to do the better PCI and better revascularization decision. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you very much to all for your lectures. Let me just uh, hand it over to uh, uh, Gary Mitz so he just makes the final wrap up of the session. Thank you. Um, so I, I, first, I want to thank S.J. Park and his colleagues for organizing TCTAP every year and for setting up this virtual session. I want to thank Javier as my co-moderator and all the panelists for the interesting discussion. And finally, I want to thank the lecturers because I found all of these talks to be fascinating and informative. And I'll turn it over back to the TCTAP people. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.